Hey everyone, I'm Jens Bogren and uh, Doth asked me to do a little bit of a mix walkthrough of their brand new song No Rest No End. That is quite of a bitch to mix to be honest. Uh, it's a pretty intense track. If you haven't checked it out, do that first and then dive back into this video. But I'm gonna play a little bit uh, from the top and uh, just scroll through my session here. Uh, it's mixed in Pro Tools, some additional gear, but most of it is already in here. And I'll show you briefly how it's done. All right, so let's start from uh, where this thing uh, smacks and I'll just uh, browse through the session a little bit. I think that's uh, enough for you guys to uh, get a grip of the song a little bit and uh, see what kind of information we have in here. So uh, up here at the top uh, I have uh, my drum tracks. It's the uh, excellent uh, Karim Lechner aka Krim playing on this track. The drum tracks here are mostly recorded microphones uh, of his actual kit. And I do have some support stuff here. For example, um, I'm using a bunch of support triggers on the snare, or not a bunch, but there are a few of them, uh, like the uh, excellent Krim drums actually happen to be on this. We can have a look. If I go to the mix window, check out the drum tracks. There's a lot of them. I have the, uh, the regular snare here. The regular snare um, is uh, supported by a ring track, that I like to call it, which is basically the same snare track, just completely smacked um, for transient and uh, leaving the, the tail. And that way I can extend the snare drum and make it sound um, like more sustainy inside the mix. These are usually decisions that are made based on a shitload of information and you need to find ways to just not make your drums sound like a little blip 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 but you want to sound full and rich and long also inside a full mix. In addition to that I'm also using a similar trick which is called my snare attack um, track. It's just there to me to be able to ride just that transient of the snare in case I need it for a specific part or a little bit throughout maybe. And there is a bottom microphone. In addition to this, I have a selection of um, samples. Uh, the main samples that I'm using uh, is powered by MIDI. I have uh, created MIDI of all kicks, snares and toms, or actually the excellent John Douglas has uh, helped me prep this session. Give some credit to him for an excellent job. And uh, the Krim drum snare looks like this. It's a plugin that we made through uh, Bogan Digital uh, in collaboration with Krim. Um, it's using the Kenny snare, Kenny Beauty. 
And it sounds like this. So I've tuned it together with a snare and uh, together with a real snare drum it creates the foundation of my, my snare drum for this track. And then I have a, a few others like um, a sample here called Ring Job. It's also in the similar vein, pretty ringy kind of um, superphonic or Black Beauty style. Uh, it's a little bit more consistent, doesn't have all the layers maybe as the uh, the Crim stuff has there. And I have one that's called Wank. Tuned a little deeper and there for consistency. And then I have a Spike. And the Spike one is um, there just to add a little bit of extra attack or snap to, to the snare. It's actually a D-drum microphone. All of these samples are fed here and it's basically, um, what is it, Jenspogen signature drums or something like that. So I'm basically using my own samples to, to support here. Uh, and that's it. All of these um, tracks build up my uh, snare mix. And that is in uh, conjunction with uh, an ambient sample, forgot to say that. And uh, quite a lot of automation, you can see that I go about, like every time there is a snare fill, I try to dim down any like support samples, try to use more of the original snare. Krim is such an excellent drummer, his, uh, his strike is so precise, so I could basically work more or less out without samples if, uh, if I would have to. Then I'm taking all of that, my whole drum mix, and feed it into two buses. You can find them here. It's called my Drums Sum and Drums Add. That's basically a parallel compressor. And on that I have a hardware insert that goes down here. And maybe we can take a photo and put it in there later. It's a Joe Meek SC2.2 um, opto compressor that I'm using uh, for the drum sound here. And in addition to that, I have a few other like support buses. Uh, for example, uh, reverbs, a whole bunch of them actually. I use a little bit of um, short reverbs and long reverbs in conjunction. If you want to know like more in depth exactly how I usually think about these, you should check out my Nail the Mix sessions from uh, URM, it's uh, more in-depth, and it would be a 10-hour video, which is literally what I've done there. In addition to, uh, to the overall parallel compressor on the drums, I'm also using what I call the Kick Horny and Snare Bomber track. Um, this is additional parallel compression just to give even more boost to uh, the kick and snare that I process accordingly to whatever I feel maybe still be missing in the drum sound when I've reached a point where I'm like 95% done with the mix. I can feel that, yeah, okay, so now when I've added everything in, maybe I could just get the snare to be a little bit more fuller or a little bit longer or whatever. Um, and then I would sort of create these kick horny and snare horny or snare bomber tracks um, and add to my mix instead of starting to you know, go in and do too much on the uh, individual tracks and uh, with the risk of getting lost. This way it's really easy to just see what would happen and uh, if it's good or not. For the kick, again, super consistent uh, drummer. We can listen to the, to the microphones here, it's a bunch of them. Okay, so there are four microphones on the main main kicks. One of them I'm not using actually. When I mix double kicks like this, and there are actually two double two kick drums, not just a sing, uh, dual pedal on the same kick drum, I usually tend to process them a little differently. Uh, usually I would do it a little bit uh, less low end on the secondary kick. So when there are fast passages, I leave the low end for the 
slower notes, uh, so to speak. That usually works really well together with bass and rhythm guitars or whatever. So if these are my original kicks, I am supporting them again with uh, the Krim drums instrument. Two different kicks there as well that I feed over MIDI. I have the anti machine gun effect, sorry, the auto double kick uh, engaged, which means that even though I feed this with just uh, one single MIDI note all the time, when it reaches a certain speed, it goes over and starts to play double kicks like this. And uh, that works excellent. Sounds like a real drummer is playing. I want to add these together. I get exactly the support I need for consistency and the ability to cut through the mix. Uh, but I do also have two other samples here. That sounds a little bit more mechanical maybe, and that's there for consistency and to be able to help even further with that final touches for the kick drum sound. I'm running them online right now. Usually I have all this printed, but for you guys to see, I have it online using a Slate Trigger fed from MIDI. And this is how it can look when I do stuff. Uh, I have a bunch of samples here and I ended up using two of them. I don't know what kind of idiot uh, labeled these um, samples, but it's called Blow Me Harder Please, Ball Slap. Um, and um, I'm going with a nice marmot and su sumo sub for this one. And together it creates a pretty natural um, and um, attacky, snappy and uh, sweet sounding kick drum. These are also fed to this like extra bus along with um, everything, both to the parallel bus and to this kick horny thing. One thing I should say there, I'm doing automation here as well as you can see, to the kicks, riding the, uh, the samples a little bit extra. There's also this foot blaster thing. That is from directly from Crim's pedals actually for a little bit of extra tick in the sound. All of these are automated uh, when it comes to uh, low end as well. As soon as the kicks start to play fast, usually what happens is that you get a build up uh, of low end in your mix. And um, if you adjust for that, the slow parts will sound thin instead. So what I usually do is that I put some sort of EQ on the kicks. Here is the MAG EQ4 Plugin Alliance plugin. Uh, that is a sweet sounding one that I usually roll off a little bit low end and then I automate the bypass on that one. So you can see here if I, if I bring up the automation tracks for this one for the mag, you can see that the bypass on this one goes on and off depending on the, uh, the section uh, of the song. And that way I can keep my low end steady. And if we move over to, uh, to the toms here, um, I'm using the original toms. You can see that's a shitload of automation going on. I'm sending all the toms to a toms sum bus. That way I can uh, like individually process the toms on their channels using SSL and uh, Pro-Q3. And then all together I can do additional processing. Uh, in this case I'm using some sort of transient shaper from Softube give a little bit more punch, take away a little bit of the sustain to make them cut through this wall of sound that this song is. Uh, and some additional EQ here for lowering low end. Additionally, that I probably found out at some stage that I was gonna have to, to do for not master to the crackle too much. Then there are a bunch of cymbal tracks, nothing really special. We have hi-hat, left and right, ride, splash, and the overheads and rooms. You can see that I cross-panned these tracks because they were recorded from an audience perspective. Uh, 
but uh, I want it to be drummer's perspective. I want to play the drums when I mix, usually. Sometimes I just want to listen. There's some gimmicks uh, over here in terms of compression, some distortion, multiband compression, uh, stuff that I'm not gonna dive into right now. And all of them are fed to my drum add bus, the parallel compressor that I have there that was the Geomake. And usually I keep the send a little below Unity when it comes to cymbals. For snares and toms, I keep it usually like way up at Unity. And uh, for kicks, I usually drop it down, especially if it's a lot of double kicks. I don't want my whole parallel drum bus to like move down in volume as soon as there are kick drums. So usually I would have to bring them down. And maybe sometimes compensate with a some sort of parallel compressor just for the uh, the kicks instead, if I feel that's needed for the sound. All right, so all of those drums are going to a general drums master bus that I use. Uh, I should say that that the hardware stuff that I have here, even though I mix almost everything inside the box these days, I do have a summing unit. Um, I don't really think that I maybe need it, but it helps me with gain staging. I'm just so used to it. So all of my main instrument groups, like drums, bass, rhythm guitars, lead guitars, keyboards, uh, orchestra, and vocals, are going out to the equivalent number of stereo stems um, that hits my summing mixer, and then it goes into an SSL compressor that I have here, and then it goes into uh, Baxendale EQ that I use for adding a little bit sheen on top and a little bit sub uh, in the low end. Then it goes back into my system again on this mix input channel where I can do some additional EQ to the overall mix, whatever is needed. Usually a little bit of treble lift additionally. And then I feed my mix into a recording track where I bounce or bounce, I, actually I print, like I record back into my system. Uh, and um, that way I can do punches. Uh, for example, I'm happy with the mix, but I need to fix this thing in the second chorus. I can just record the second chorus again and uh, glue it together. On this track where I record two, I have two limiters, and that's pretty crucial for me to be able to hear sort of what the mastering will do to my mix. Because if I don't use these, chances are big that I'm gonna undermix uh, my snare drum and maybe uh, my kicks as well. Um, so using this, I can compress the, uh, the mix, but I don't print them. So I sort of treat the mastering as a separate step where I start over, and that way I have a way more dynamic mix than I have while mixing it, actually, which uh, works really well for me. Next thing we could um, look at here could be the rhythm guitars. That's usually the next thing I mix. If I'm sort of happy with uh, my basic drum layout, um, always mixed while hearing the rest of the song, I should add, even though it's just like a rough mix or something, uh, at least the rhythm guitars and usually the vocals are stuff that I need to get in there just um, roughly. Um, it doesn't have to be the, f uh, the final sound as long as it eats uh, frequencies and steal attention. That way I know what I need to do with my drums for them to sit in the mix. I'm developing these plugins of my own through Bogon Digital, so uh, that has really helped me actually do my own mixes because I would put on maybe the Rev C guitar plugin or the BDH bundle, um, and that way I get something that is going to be very close to whatever I decide to reamp down the line. Since uh, well, I made those plugins, so it's uh, tailored to my to my taste. So for the guitars on this track. I decided to uh, to reamp. We have four of them. It's four rhythm guitars. Like I see them as two pairs: the main pair and the secondary pair. And uh, for this, I reamped using uh, a Mesa Boogie and a EVH. Uh, and that was actually a scientific choice. I usually do that. I reamp with a or record a reamp with a bunch of different setups. 
and then I sit down and try to iron out, uh, all right, so what fits my mix the best? Uh, is it the same on both sides? Uh, is it the um, Mesa? Is it the um, EVH? Is it the diesel? Uh, whatever I have, I have too many, like 20 <laughs> heads or something. And um, whatever seems to work the best, I would use. Sometimes that would be the same in the left, right. Sometimes it would be um, different, like in this case. Usually that creates this broader thing uh, going on. Um, and if I would use my own plugins for that, I would probably, you know, perhaps put the RevC on one side and uh, one of the BDH plugins on the other side, or two different BDH plugins, like the uh, 5169 and the 6606 on each side, like I did here on the secondary channels, actually. So I'm reamping with the real stuff, the main guitars, but on the secondary ones, I'm actually using um, amp sims. And just don't tell anyone, will you? So let's listen to this. Okay, so listening guitars is a very stupid thing to do. It uh, will wear your uh, ears down pretty quickly. But that's uh, what we have here. It's uh, the main tracks are supported by guitar three and four. This is um, reamped through some outboard gear, so I don't think I have too much on the mix here. Uh, well, a little bit on the Mesa, uh, including a low cut, control some low end. On the EVH, it's a little bit less. But this is pretty typical, it's not too drastic. It's like 0.6 dB here, 0.67 there, etc. And then I'm using this Pro MB thing. It could also be a C4. The C4 shifts the face a little too much, I think, so I've started to use this much more. Um, and this is a classic trick where you can control the palm mutes, the low end that uh, comes through. And they, that way you can keep your guitars a little meatier throughout and don't have to compromise the EQ based on the, uh, the parts where the most low end happens. All of that goes through my Rhythm Guitar Master. I have some additional EQ there. Well, not much. <laughs> this is actually an MS EQ configured um, using the Epure V3, where I do a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of uh, stereo broadening, frequency-based. It's a little bit more clarity on the sides only. And um, some little fixing EQ here. And then I use a plugin that I use quite often actually on, on my guitar tracks. It's the Vitamin from, from Waves. Uh, there's a harmonic generator uh, in a multi-band setup. A little bit of a dangerous plugin maybe, but it usually works pretty fine. Uh, sometimes I put that as a little bit of a smiley EQ so that I get more resonance or more um, harmonics from the lows and the, the very highs. Uh, on this track I seem to have chosen a little bit more even approach. Then there are some stuff here that is on there. Uh, a compressor on the rhythm bus that is not working as a compressor per se. Uh, I usually don't compress my rhythm guitars uh, much at all. Sometimes a little bit parallel compression maybe. But uh, I do have this uh, volume riding compressor that keys from the vocals. You can see more about that in uh, those nail the mixes that I did. This is the standard thing that's been with me for many, many years, where I basically take um, either a compressor or the excellent track space plugin, uh, usually not on rhythm guitars, but on lead guitars and keyboards, I usually use the track spacer in, in uh, addition to some other compressor that keys from vocals. So as soon as vocals is active, these would just dip down that half, half a dB or dB um, to make more room for the vocals and sort of fill the void as soon as the, the vocals uh, are gone. Um, can be a little bit dangerous if you're not used to hearing like small, small nuances in your mixes. But um, for me it's very powerful and makes my mixing more fun and more dynamic and easier to listen to. All right, so that's the end of uh, part one of this walkthrough video. Go check the link below for part two found on uh, URM Academy.